o'clock or a little after, so we'll get started and I welcome you to the first resident council meeting of the year. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I hope all of you got a ticket when you came in for the door prize that'll be drawn for later. If not, raise your hand and we'll get it to you. I think everybody's got one. Okay, just a couple of things. Be sure and silence your cell phone now, if you will. And also, we've got a lot of new, mem new people living with us, and if you remember to wear your name tag, it will be helpful. Oh, I did have mine on. I do forget it myself. So uh, the, other, the only other thing I want to say is I want to encourage all of you, if you have a suggestion or a question or anything, be sure and put a note in the suggestion box. As a matter of fact, I got one on the way in here today. So be happy, we'll be happy to do what we can uh, if you will just give us a suggestion. All right, well, to lead off the meeting today, I'm going to call on Dan Norton to give us a treasurer's report. Dan? Okay, the Employee Appreciation Program had a very good year for 2021. 98% of the residents participated in this program. That is a fantastic number. You can hear me? They may need to turn that speaker on over there. Okay, on the monthly contributions, we received 119,000. Now that's where the residents have an amount added to their statement, and it's $119,000. Then we also get contributions in on an annual basis. Got $17,000 there. Uh, for a total contributions for the year of $136,000. $136,000. As you can see, the monthly contribution plan is much more successful and effective than the annual plan. We got 119 on the monthly, 17 on the annual. Of the current 247 residents, 203 are participating in the monthly plan. Now that participation rate is 82%, is a good number, but I really believe we can do better. I really do. Uh, so, uh, the difference between the 247 and the 203 that are participating is 44, which means that 44 residents are not participating in the program. So if you're one of those 44, I'm gonna put a form in your box. All you gotta do is sign it and put it back in my box and everybody will be happy. Uh, of the 211 employees that we gave gifts to, our total gift was $137,000. So that means we really gave $1,000 more than we took in. That, that is an average of $649 per employee. Which, which means that, you know, some got over and some got less. But $649 is a nice gift. So again, if you're not participating in the program, see me, please. Anybody have any questions, comments, gifts, contributions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Dan does a lot of work to get this 
together, and we appreciate that. But more than that, I thank you, the residents. $137,000, that's a lot of money. And I can tell you that the members of the council, all of them have heard from the employees how much they appreciate it. It really makes a difference for them. So thank you uh, for, for your contribution. And we hope that this next year, will, or this year's gifts will even be even better. Okay, some of you are new, and let me just say that the resident council has an election every year. There are nine of us on the council. Now, actually, there's only eight this year. Diane Clark moved to Houston to be with her family, so we have not replaced her. So there are only eight of us right now, but in March we will have an election, and four of the, there are four positions that will be up for election. Five were elected last year, four this year, and it's two-year staggered term. So that way, uh, we'll we'll have uh, a new new election in March, and it's the bylaws say that the council will appoint a nominating committee, which we have done, and we have five people, and I would like to call their names and then get the chairman to come make her a remark. The chairman this year is going to be uh, Elizabeth Wall. Elizabeth, would you stand? And then also working with her will be uh, Martha Ann Corlew, Jack Hinton, uh, Jim Stock, and Carolyn Tyler. If you're there, here, please stand up. There's Jim, Martha Ann, Jack, and Carolyn. <clears throat> Those five will come up with the nominees and will run the election, and then in March, after the election, they'll announce who the winners are. Elizabeth, you want to come up and fill everybody in? Thank you, and thank you for serving. Okay. The members of the council whose terms expire in April 2022 are Rick Paskowitz, Ken Plunk, Diane Clark, who, as you have just heard, has moved away, and Jack Hinton, who does not want to run again. The independent residents of the village will elect four people to fill these positions, and the terms of those to be elected will run from April 2022 to April 2024. And you independent residents are absolutely essential to this process. The nominating committee is asking you to suggest names of the residents whom you feel would be good members of the council and who have agreed to serve if elected. An information sheet saying how to make your suggestions will be in your boxes tomorrow. And then you will have from Monday, uh, January 31st, until Thursday, February 10th, to turn names in. And the nominating committee will select eight candidates from the names you submit. The ballots for the new council members will be placed in your boxes on Monday, March the 14th, to be returned to the front desk and placed in a locked ballot box by uh, Monday, March the 21st. And John has already introduced the other members of the nominating committee, and I'm so glad to be working with them, and they're, they're showing me what I need to do because I haven't done this before. If you have any questions after you read the information sheet, please call me. My number is on it. And thank you very much. This would not be possible without you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank the rest of you that are going to serve on the committee. I know you'll do a good job. We uh, now... No sound on television. We'll get Kaylee to check that out. I sure can't fix it, but anyway. <laughs> 
As we announced last uh, month in December, and we welcomed Jesse Critton back as head of dining, the lady that did that job for 14 years has taken on, Maria White has taken on a, a big job, and we're excited for her, and we thought it would be good if she came and kind of gave us an overview of what her new job is. But before she comes, I have to, an apology. Last month, when we recognized all of the employees that had been here for more than 10 years, I overlooked Maria. Maria had been, has been here 14 years, and I did not call her name, and for that I apologize, Maria. But uh, certainly she came here in uh, September of 2007. She's done a wonderful job for us all these years. So, Maria, why don't you come tell us what, what your new, new challenging job is? Y'all only thought you were going to get through a council meeting without seeing me. <laughs> nice try. Um, so before I start talking about my job, I just want to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of what it was like when you moved from your house to independent living and what a monumental task that felt like and how you had to go through everything that you had in your house and cut it down to fit into a room, cut it down again and then bring it here and then cut it down again. And imagine doing that when you're not as strong and able-bodied as you are now. And maybe your family lives out of town or COVID hits and nobody can come in and you need somebody to help with that. So this job was created with the need for family relations in mind and for resident interaction. So this role will focus mainly on family engagement and then anything we can do to help the residents there. Obviously marketing will be included in that, outreach to the community. Um, it's a presence in the building. Before this position existed, all of the communication went through the health center. So if you needed to talk to anybody who knew what was going on, you had to go through Rebecca or Felicia, and that's a lot of calls, especially when nobody can come in the building to help. So they created this role as an outreach for y'all so that anybody that needs help can get help. So that's me. Um, Obviously, with my background being dining, I'm going to try to tie a lot of hospitality in over there. I'll give it a little bit of time, but I think I know some people that can help. Um, sorry, I'm reading through my notes here. I want to make sure I cover everything. I think the biggest thing for me is I feel very blessed that I've had such a strong IL interaction with everyone here because it's helped me build relationships and helped me give a familiar face and give y'all more of a comfortable feeling. And I think that that's important, especially in a transitional period that can be really difficult that makes it a little bit easier, especially if you know who you're talking to. Um, obviously we want to be the best assisted living and the whole city and the competition's getting steep. So I am open as always to any feedback y'all have for things that you've heard that could be improved or things that maybe one day you might want for yourself. So um, in addition to that, we are also looking for a lot of volunteers. I would love if there's anybody who is willing to volunteer in a wellness aspect. I would like to get some charity yoga classes and things like that started. Um, we've got a lot of residents who would love to do those sorts of things but can't quite get down to the wellness center. Bible studies, um, art classes, just anything. It's just, I think that what makes the village so special is the relationships that we've all built with each other and that y'all have always taking care of each other. Everybody's got a friend that watches them, watches out for them. And I want to continue that as a village because it is a village. It's one unit. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. I know you'll do a great job because you did such a wonderful job in the dining area. And thank you again for, for all you've done and are going to be doing for us. Next, I call on Ken Plunk to make uh, a, the annual report 
of the uh, Village of Germantown Foundation. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. Uh, let me begin with the financial results for the foundation. Total assets ended the year at $2,222,000, and that's an increase of $272,000, or 14% over December 31, 2020. We enjoyed income of just under $400,000, and 77% of that came from investment returns, and the balance came from gifts from our residents. Thank you. The investment portfolio uh, posted a yield of 16% in 2021. We're quite proud of that. Uh, we're 84% invested in equities and 16% in fixed income. Unfortunately, the Mr. Market has taken away uh, a part of those gains in January, but uh, we'll stay after it. Expenses for the year total $123,000. Uh, $117,000 or 95% of that were gifts to the Village Incorporated. Uh, 71,000 went for benevolence and $47,000 went to the Piano Fund. I might add that the $47,000 to the Piano uh, Fund were designated gifts from residents as well as employees of the Village and not a penny of that money came from a general fund. I might also add that uh, this is the first year that the foundation has been able to cover 100% of the benevolence need here at the village. Um, let me also share with you that uh, our bylaws call for an annual board meeting, which we held just this morning. And at that meeting, we reelected the four officers of the foundation. We reelected eight of the nine board members. One board member, uh, who is Mike, is elected by the Village Inc. And that was done at their board meeting on Tuesday of this week. Uh, last year, we updated the trifold brochure that I've talked about uh, before. And if you haven't seen that brochure, you can pick up one at the front desk, and you will notice that uh, there's a section for giving. And if you care to make a gift, please fill out that form and uh, place it in the box at the front desk. I'd be glad to answer any questions, if any of you have any. If not, thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. The foundation does great work, and if it was not for the foundation contributing uh, to the benevolence needs of the village, it would be added to our cost as residents. So it's, it's a real benefit uh, what the foundation has done and especially those of you that have contributed. Thank you so much for that. Next, I'll call on Jerry Klein to give us a Germantown update. Jerry. Thank you, John. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Lots of things are going on in the area that might be of interest to you. A local Memphis developer has purchased the 100 North Main building and the same week bought the Carry 4 Mall at Kirby and Poplar. The former developer of Kirby Woods, if I recall, has been here and uh, it's probably been four, maybe five years ago talking about changes and what have you. Well. The changes have gone to the, at least to the, to the planning stage. A video was made 
And I must admit that I have seen the video just recently, and it is without a doubt spectacular. The new developer has seen the video, and he says, man, I'm not going to change a thing, hardly. Why the other developers bowed out, I have no idea. But the new people that are going to handle this thing are very well known and very well respected, and I think we're all going to be very happy with the result. Later in the spring, there's going to be a new breakfast spot here in town. The Toasted Yoke will be located at Stone Creek Center at Poplar and Forest Hill Irene. And speaking of eating, one of my favorite pastimes, Gus's Famous Fried Chicken has just opened at 3100 Forest Hill Irene Road. If you've never tried it, you need to go by there and give it a try. I think you'll enjoy it. If you haven't already noticed, there's new carpet both here and in the, in the uh, dining room. And it seems to me that the new carpet in the Monarch, I should say not dining room, in the, new, in the Monarch, it appears to me that the noise level has gone down a bit with the new carpet. Now, hopefully that'll continue. But anyway, I hope you all enjoy it. Just before coming here today, I got a phone call from the Germantown Police Department. They have reached out with a, with a message to pass to all of you. And the message is simply this, lock it or lose it. You can save yourself lots of pain and anguish if you simply lock your car when you get out. If you have any valuables, take them with you, put them in the glove box or trunk and just lock it up. It's just that simple. And they have always said time after time, if anyone sees anything that looks suspicious or you're wondering about, don't hesitate, call your local police department. The number of COVID cases may have gone down, but unfortunately it is still with us. You've got to continue to wear a mask in both in the public spaces in the village and when you go out. There are a lot of businesses today where you cannot even get in the door unless you have your mask on. Beware, always keep it with you. Wash your hands with warm water and soap. Keep six feet between others and use your hand sanitizers between washings. That's about all for the moment, but there are simple rules to follow to stay safe. Thanks a lot and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we'll move to committee reports now, and Margaret Owen will report on the activities committee. Margaret? I'm sure. A lot of you have already gotten the calendar in your mailbox, but anyway, I just wanted to let you know that, as always, our resident services are doing a great job. I mean, I don't know how they come up with all the wonderful things they have. So very quickly, I'm going to tell you, Tuesday, February the 1st, we're celebrating Chinese New Year. New Year. Now, who would have thought of that? But anyway, we're all going to have a dinner so we can all be together. Uh, Wednesday the 3rd, History Talk with Mark Brown at the River I Stand. On February the 4th, the Eagle Bus Tour is going to uh, entertain with Southbound? I'm not sure I understand that. Eagle Bus Tour? We're having an Eagle Bus Tour and then entertainment with the Southbound that night. All right. <laughs> okay. On the 10th, we're going to have a trip to Bozo's in Mason, Tennessee, where you can eat some good barbecue. And that night, we're going to have side street steppers, which I think is a favorite of a lot of you. On the 13th, we're going to have the Super Bowl party in the Polo Lounge, which we used to do before the pandemic, but we're going to do it again this year. Uh, on the 14th, it's Valentine's Day, and we're going to have a newlywed game. And then that night, we're going to have a concert, Just Friends Band. On the 18th, the entertainment will be the Memphis Sideshow. On the 21st, Monday, historian Mike Ellicott is going to talk on women in World War II. And on the 22nd, 2-22-22 is going to be Tuesday, and they're going to have Taco Tuesday on that day. So try to say that a lot. 
Okay, on the 25th, we're going to have entertainment by Julianne Thomas and Dom Forsco, singer and piano player. And on the 28th, the night I died at the palace, we hope to put on, we've put it off several times, but it's a cute play, and if nothing else, you will see how well some of us cannot act because, <laughs> but we're gonna do, we're gonna make you laugh at how well we can not act. So that's about it, thanks, bye. All right, thank you for all the great activities that we have here, and I hope you will take advantage of them. Uh, next is Building and Grounds, Jack Hinton. Thank you, John. Welcome, everyone. We're glad you're here, and I know that you may notice some, some things that are taking place around the campus. Jerry's already uh, made note about the uh, new carpet that you all are sitting on, and uh, we hope that uh, you like like it and it's going to be very serviceable so that the whole area now has the same carpet and we do like the new carpet in the monarch uh those who install it said it was was a, was it the best they'd ever installed in terms of of as far as noise and all was concerned so we we're pleased about that we uh if you haven't noticed you've walked down the hall of Billiards room is being uh, renovated, and uh, that's uh, for two purposes. One, everybody that w that uh, comes here, so I'm told by marketing, is want to know where the bill billiard room is. Uh, but I also hope that uh, when it's uh, re it, that's going to be completed later this week. And if you haven't been, if you haven't played billiards or shot pool as well. I know about it, then maybe it'd be more inviting for you to do so. Um, as far as uh, other things concerned inside, uh, we're going to be replacing the hardwood that's out across from the entrance to the auditorium and Monarch. And uh, that that's, it, it's going to be beginning in the, in the next two weeks. Um, we've also replaced some of the flooring in, in uh, uh, I think it's in the F wing that need for entrance there, uh, and that's going to uh, that's for safety reasons, and so that's being done. We got a new poker table uh, that's going to be placed. Those those of you who enjoy that, and uh, you folks don't know it, but of the the number of people that play the women are the better poker players than the men. Uh, they seem to As far as uh, the, we have heat uh, in, in the area of the pool, but the pool is, has not yet, that part has not come to reheat the pool. And as soon as it's here, uh, that that will be installed, and we're looking at four to five weeks yet before that can be done. We also note we're getting some new uh, shopping carts, and uh, we're tired of using those that have been handed to us by the grocery stores, and they'll have our own logo on them, and maybe that way we can keep them. Sometimes those things seem to wander off, and uh, so we're working at uh, doing something about that. Uh, then, as far as outside is concerned, uh, you may have noticed some new uh, teak bench benches around and some tables. And out and near the entrance here, you'll notice that there's one that's been placed around a tree that's going to be uh, sort of beautified, and there will be others of those across the campus. We were. We are uh, installing some additional cameras at the Germantown gate, uh, which have been added for security reasons, and um, we, we're, we're pleased about that. Also, the fencing uh, uh, the, around the, the fence, we've, that we've replaced all the fence, and so all that's being cleaned up. 
The next thing that's going to be happening in landscaping uh, will be as soon as it, the weather permits, uh, we will be start doing some drainage uh, correction, which is very necessary uh, on our campus. But the most exciting thing about outside, I think, is the fact that, as you know, we've been working on uh, some walking trails. We now have established four walking trails. And on those walking trails, we, we will identify the 34 different species of trees that we have here. And uh, uh, there'll, there'll be signs on the, on the trees identifying that and something about them. And that's very important. Uh, and that's to, to give us an opportunity maybe to encourage more people to walk. And so as soon as that's completed, and it should be by this summer, uh, when, you can, uh, when you can walk those trails, we'll have a brochure showing you all of that. And we hope that you will enjoy it very much. And I want to give uh, uh, credence to uh, Lee Brown and uh, Mary Stokesbury and Laura Lee Apperson, and also Ashley Sutherland, who works in house and and building and grounds who have been the ones who have, have worked on this and established for us. And so we owe them, uh, I think, a gratitude for what they're doing. Um, now I'd like to call on John Krosnos if he would come and talk to us about the brick problem. Here he is. Come, John. Hello. Talking about bricks. Can all of you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think you're all aware that we have a veterans memorial, and it consists of uh, flags in a circle in front of a main entrance. Uh, with the Star Spangled Banner in the middle. And it's paved with bricks. And today you see a sample of some of the pavers that are out there. There's a pop, a, a, a nearly 150 bricks now that have been purchased and are offered as memorials to good friends loved ones, and so on. So take a look at what's written on the bricks. You too can have a brick, an opportunity for you, and also you should know that all the proceeds from the bricks go to the um, foundation, the Village Foundation, and you just had a report on the Village Foundation. So, some changes. You don't have to be a veteran to memorialize somebody. You can, you can buy a brick for just anybody you want. So it's open to everybody. So if you have a loved one who is not a veteran, that's okay. We invite you to purchase a memorial brick. This year, um, the price has dropped. This, this cheap Norwegian appreciates that. It's gone down to a hundred bucks per brick, or if you buy two or more, it's seventy dollars per brick. And remember that that is going to the foundation, and so it is tax deductible. So. Um, you have the pictures. The applications are at the table. You can pick one up as you leave. Um, and I think that's about it. So are there any questions? Thank you.
Thank you, Jack and John. Uh, dining is next. And Alice, you have someone you'd like to call up, I think. I think the rug has been pulled out from under me. Jesse, are you here? Well, you slipped in. You'd rather hear the news about dining from the horse's mouth, and he's here. <laughs> Jesse Crittenden. Horse's mouth. I've been called worse, actually, <laughs> today, actually. So that's not too bad. Well, first, uh, first uh, resident council in a long time, so this is great. But um, I know you've heard me say it probably a thousand times a day already, but I am so glad to be back. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Y'all can't hear me ever because I mumble and I'd look down the whole time I talk. <laughs> so... Um, but no, I, I just, I can't tell y'all how happy I am to be back with y'all. So many familiar faces and so many new ones. Been trying to meet everybody. Um, I don't quite have the memory that I used to have when I was here in 2006, so <laughs> forgive me if, I'm, if I ask your name a few times, and I've been trying to wear my name tag every day, so I, it always helps when you have yours on. So um, unfortunately, this month we didn't get to have dining committee, um, which Actually, y'all missed out because it was a very short agenda. You know, typically my dining committee agendas are lengthy and they have to sit and listen to me for an hour. Mr. Stock remembers that probably, um, probably t too, too much. But um, um, really, every year I go over, for my January meeting, I go over the goals. Um, I go over the goals that we've come up with as a team in dining for the community as it pertains to dining. And so... Um, this year, um, it was going to be the same, really. Um, and, and our goals for dining, it's one. Uh, usually, we just come up with four or five. One goal this year is really to get back to a sort of normalcy without the use of COVID. The word COVID is going to disappear from vocabularies. We can read about it, hear about it enough. But um, I think that um, for us, it's really to move past that as we can with still keeping COVID in mind. COVID's not going anywhere, so it's how we, we, we live with it, as well as moving forward with our dining program and still do all the fun stuff. Um, I can't say enough about what Maria and the team did while I was gone and, um, and how they took care of y'all through the COVID times. I've, I've seen a lot of the menus and seen what they did. It looked like they kept it fun, as exciting as it could possibly be with getting it to go box delivered, you know, so. Um, I can't say thank you enough to them. Uh, you know, moving forward, um, the, the biggest things for us is, again, getting back to that sense of normalcy. Um, and that really, for us, it breaks down into a few different parts. There's a lot in that. Um, the first part of that is stabilized staffing. Um, as, I mean, it's, it's no secret. Every industry is, is suffering from that right now. So it's how we get creative with that. It's how we get creative with recruitment. And so, you know, thinking outside of the box, we're, we're really reaching everywhere that we can to recruit and, you know, to find the right people. Uh, there's people that apply, but they're not people that need to be working here. So um, as we were picky before, we're going to remain to be just as picky now because, you know, I, I know that I used to say it up here a lot that we'll interview 20 before we hire one. We'll still do that if that's what it takes to hire the right one. So um, the last thing we need to do is get the wrong person here, and we're just going to turn them right back over, and you're going to have an unpleasant experience. So um, with recruitment, it's, that's, that's a big focus for us. Um, it's also on our onboarding. It's our retention. Um, what are we doing to keep our folks here? You know, and and our, again, our new folks, when they come in, how are we welcoming them into the community? How is our training? How is... It's, it's one big package there. I think that people look at, sometimes I look at staffing as, 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 as just one level. Um, there, there's a lot more to that, and we're, we're, we're challenging ourselves. I just got, I was a little bit late to the meeting, sorry. Didn't mean to scare you. Uh, because I was in our manager meeting, we're going over ways that, you know, if we have folks that are challenging with us right now, but, but they're folks that we should keep, then what can we do to keep them here? Um, you know, if, 
if we have um, other departments that can help out. So, you know, we're, we're really getting creative right now with that. Um, because again, you know, for our goal this year is, is stabilized staffing. That's gonna be a big piece of it is keeping the folks we have in-house right now, making sure we, new folks come in, we get them trained and acclimated to the community properly. Um, opening up the Monarch for full service. I know I've heard that a few times since I've been back. Uh, that is, that's gonna happen as soon as we reach that first part of that, that stabilized staffing piece. 90% of our servers have never served. It's, it's, this is what they've seen is the buffet style. So there's a lot of training that goes into that. And I will say, I'm sorry and thank you on the front end. S sorry, because we will make a few mistakes and thank you for your patience when we do get rolling in that. I mean, we're, it's, it's gonna happen. We have a lot of great kids that um, we're just gonna, we're gonna make a few mistakes coming out. We'll do a lot of planning in the front end to make sure that doesn't happen in order to mitigate as much of that as we can, but it's gonna happen. And so again, I appreciate your patience in, in all of that as we, as we move forward with that. Um, getting our menu back in the bar, that's, a big, that's gonna be a big one for us too. That's been missed as well. Our event's coming back. I'm glad Super Bowl party's coming back. That's gonna be a, a lot of fun. I can't wait to see the Chiefs win. And so I was, I was hoping, that, I was supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited the Chiefs are doing well. So, But just parties like that, we will be starting breakfast back up next month as well. I know I, I was really trying to get it back this month. Next month we're going to start on the second and fourth Friday of the month. I'll get that communication out to, to everyone. Um, we'll do the breakfast in the bistro. For those of you who weren't here when I was here or did it before, um, it's, it's just a breakfast twice a month in the bistro. You can come in your PJs, you can you just come as you are. It's, it's a fun time, all you can eat, and I do all the cooking for that. So it's, it's fun for me as well. And now that, now that I only live a couple blocks away, it's, it'll be a lot easier to get here at 4.30 in the morning. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But, but really just getting back to the wine dinners and a lot of the, you know, I, I think that I'm a, a little bit of a benefit. I didn't see, you know, the last two years of, of, of what, um, you know, the program looked like. I still have the picture of what it was, you know, kind of snapshot when I left. So I'm looking forward to doing the, the wine dinners and a lot of that fun stuff that, that um, hopefully we can get back in here now. That some of the regulations and some of the things are, are toning down a little bit. But, um, but really, um, you know, a big goal for us too is just the communication piece of that. We will have, um, I, we will have things that happen. I mean, obviously, COVID is, is still gonna be there. So we still you know, may not get a truck in one day or we still, things may happen. But I wanna make sure that we're communicating that to you properly. Um, however, that's, that's, that's gonna go out. So um, we will start with our quarterly newsletter with dining again, um, as well as the communication piece on that as well. But, um, and you know, I, I know I'd say it a thousand times, but please don't hesitate to let us know we have a pre-shift every day with staff. We have a post-shift every day with staff. So let us know how we're doing, please. If, if you don't like your meal, if you don't like, if, if we didn't meet, uh, or ex actually I should say, if you liked your meal and you had great service, let us know. <laughs> but if we fell short at all, let us know uh, because we can get that fixed right away. You know, every, again, every night we send out a, a post-shift, we all read it and we put plans in place the next day to hope that, um, you know, that wherever we fell short didn't happen again. So um, just please, 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 my door is always open. Even if it's closed, slide a note under it. Um, call me, whatever we can do. Um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to assess and I'm still kind of getting reacclimated. So it's, 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 been, it's been great to be back, but I'm still learning. And as, after being here 13 years, I'd, I'd have everything down, but I'm still learning some things. So. Um, our dining committee, that was, that was basically, it was to go over the goals. Um, but again, I'm, I can't thank um, you know, Mike enough for the opportunity to come back, y'all for the opportunity to, to, to serve you again. And I can't tell you all the kind words and, and encouragement, um, just the welcome that I've, I've had. So it's, it's been great. And um, just again, you know, let me know how we can, we can make things better. Um, but again, tell us if we're doing good too, that always helps. So. Anybody want to yell at me? No? I'm going to walk backwards. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. It is great to have you back. Uh, next is the welcome committee. Ken. Ooh. 
Thank you, John. It's my pleasure to introduce five new residents that have joined us since the last meeting. Uh, let me begin with uh, Brenda Levy. Brenda, would you come forward, please? Brenda was born in Alabama and has resided in Memphis for 30 years, so we're glad to have you with us, Brenda. Next is Mary and Charles Cape. Would you come forward, please? Let me tell you about the Capes. Uh, Mary is a native Memphian, and Charles is from North Dakota. Uh, Charles moved to Memphis in 1965. He uh, is a neurologist and is retired, but still continues to work part-time in research. Uh, his and Mary's combined families include seven children, 17 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. Uh, they tell me they love the village, and they love the people, and they love living here. Welcome to the village. Our other two uh, new residents, I don't think they could be. I'll introduce them nevertheless. First is Betty Arndt, A-R-N-D-T. Uh, she moved into E333 on December the 28th and they are redecorating a new apartment and uh, Betty will move to that as soon as the uh, redecoration is complete. And also Connie Benton, uh, I'm sorry, Connie Bolton. Connie Bolton resides in F-173 and moved in December the 28th. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, new residents, for joining us. We hope you enjoy the village as much as we have. Uh, next is Rick Paskowitz on wellness. Thank you, Aaron. This is the wellness committee, but it's being brought to you by the Germantown Community Library. Why do we care? Why books? Why wait for your doctor? Why wait for your car to be fixed? Why wait for a meeting to start? Why carry a heavy purse with a heavy book or a heavy laptop? Why don't you read your own downloaded book on your own telephone? And you read your book, that's why. You don't have to wait for anybody. You're reading your book and the doctor or the fix it for your car has to wait on you. And you have to give up your book to go and see them. And Reading books is linked to better memory. The act of reading exercises your brain and encourages you to remember things like characters, plot points, or information. All of this according to the American Alzheimer's Society. And Reading is a great way to keep your mind sharp. So the Germantown Community Library has this great thing called our ebook and e-audiobook services. At the Germantown Community Library, 
card holders have a free access to Reads, R E A D S, a Tennessee wide free ebook and digital audio book lending ne network. And there are no late charges. If prompted for the PIN number, the default is the last four digits of your own telephone. So this comes about through something called overdrive. This is not about your car. This is about a library lending thing that's also associated with Libby. And it's a free, got that? Free book downloads from the Germantown Library. So what do you need? You need a library card. How many of you have Germantown Library, Germantown Community? Okay, library cards. So once you have a library card, okay, then you can call them and say, hey, or download the app and say, hey, I want to download a book. And it comes to you in five minutes. You don't have to go to the library. You don't have to pick it up. You don't have to take it back. And you don't have to worry about late charges. So the sign up is free. And a, a quote from a song about, about books, we love to read and open up our minds now. We love to read ever since we learned how. We love to read. Can't wait to turn the page now. We love to read. We love to read. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. And he didn't play an instrument for us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you again. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Rick is going to work to get you all signed up. For those that don't have a, a card, uh, a library card, you can, he'll, he'll be contacting you to get you, help you get a card. Okay, next up is our Chief Executive Officer, Mike Kraft. Mike, come give us a report. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, yes, good idea. Keep us from echoing, I think. Okay. Um, first, I wanted to give you a COVID update. Uh, Jerry Klein mentioned it briefly. Uh, everyone knows the word Omicron now. That's the big news that's going around everywhere. Uh, it's highly contagious, much more so than previous uh, variants of the virus, and it's more resistant to the vaccine uh, than the others were. Many people who are fully vaccinated and boosted have come down with uh, COVID via the Omicron variant, uh, but very few of those are getting real sick. Uh, if you look at the statistics of the COVID patients in the hospital, especially in intensive care, uh, almost none of them uh, have uh, been vaccinated and boosted. And uh, of those who have been unfortunate enough and, and far enough along to pass away, even fewer of those, it's really rare that anyone vaccinated and boosted would reach that point. Uh, here in Shelby County, the Omicron surge recently, I think was the biggest one we've had uh, to date. Hospitalizations have been very high, uh, but again, it's mostly unvaccinated people. Uh, the trailing seven-day average of new COVID cases in Shelby County is 1,251. That's a lot, but it's about half what it was three weeks ago uh, when there were almost 2,400 cases per day average. And in fact, one day earlier this month, there were 3,400 new cases in just one day. Now people point out that it's probably more than that, and it is because if you take a rapid test at home, uh, it does not get reported if you are positive. And a lot of people are doing that. I know my wife and I take them two or three times a week at home uh, just to uh, 
just to give a little added assurance. Uh, yesterday, the new cases was down to 1,078, so it's definitely trending down. Measured by the Center for Medicare Services, the 14-day positivity rate is now 30 percent. Uh, earlier this month, it was 42 percent, so that's coming down. Before you get too excited, back in the summer it was 2.1 percent, so that's what we want to get back to when there's just not much at all. Uh, yesterday it was 20 percent, so it's going up and down a little bit, but certainly trending down. Uh, currently, I think there's about 19,000 active COVID cases in Shelby County, and that's down from about 25,000 earlier this month, so that's going down. Uh, another good piece of news is the transmission rate is below one again. It's 0.85, and it had been to 1.71, so it's about half of what it was, and uh, that means that for everyone that has COVID, not everyone is giving it to someone else, so it's shrinking in terms of the pandemic. Uh, as of today, 59% of eligible Shelby County residents have received at least one dose of the vaccine, uh, and 51% are fully vaccinated. We're still trailing the rest of the country, uh, but Omicron did motivate quite a few people, even around here, to go get vaccinated. So we've seen quite a few uh, new ones. The area hospitals are very full. Uh, a day or two ago, the ICU rooms were at 99% capacity. And a couple of days ago, that meant that there were literally two vacant ICU beds in Shelby County. Uh, but uh, I think that may have come down in the last day. Uh, the uh, hospitals are suffering from nursing staff shortages. Uh, we are here, anyone in healthcare is, and I think the hospitals are hit even worse uh, than we are. I just hear all sorts of horror stories uh, there. Uh, we're testing here at the village in accordance with CMS and CDC guidelines, and the frequency of testing varies depending on how bad the COVID uh, is out in the community and also here at the village. Uh, since Christmas, now you're going to be shocked at this number because it's a high number. Since Christmas, uh, we've had about 40 employees test positive for COVID here at the village. Uh, that is a really high number, but it's a lot better positivity rate than you're seeing out in the general public. Uh, if our positivity rate was running the same as the general public, we would have had over 100. Uh, so we're, uh, as high as that sounds, we're doing uh, much better. Uh, currently, there are only three active cases of employees. So most of these were a little while back, and more recently now it's just one or two occasionally. Uh, and of course, those three are not at work. They are isolated until it's safe for them to come back. Uh, one thing that I really appreciate here is that we always tell everyone, including you residents, if you're feeling bad, don't get out and get checked and make sure you don't have COVID. And if you do, isolate yourself. And we've been having really good success with our employees uh, raising the flag when they tell us they don't uh, feel good and they get tested, whether it's here or somewhere else. And uh, if they are positive, we get them out of here. Uh, and that helps prevent further spread. Uh, one thing that helps in that regard is that we do provide uh, COVID short-term disability pay. So if someone does have COVID, they get some time off uh, paid if we oversee the testing and know that they have to be uh, moved out for a period of time. Uh, as far as residents go, we've had six residents test positive, three in independent living and three in skilled. Uh, some didn't feel well, and a couple were fairly sick, but nobody had to go to the hospital. And uh, that tells us that the vaccine is helping because a year ago, some of them probably wouldn't have made it. And uh, fortunately, we've not had that uh, to worry about in a while. Uh, we believe most of these residents from talking with them and doing contact tracing got it from family members. Uh, in skilled nursing, it was probably family that came in to visit, and I know at least uh, 
Some of them in independent living got it from going out of here and visiting with family members. So that tends to be one of the biggest sources of infection. Uh, right now, there's no active cases among residents, so they've all recovered and, and uh, served their time. Uh, we uh, continue to watch what we do here and try to maintain safe conditions. Uh, we are still not having any big events where masks would not be worn for a long period of time, such as we canceled this birthday party last month and the New Year's Eve party uh, because people would have been in here close together, packed tightly without masks. So we're not trying to have those. Uh, visitors must still wear masks when they come through the corridors and they're only allowed to come in to go to your homes. Uh, we're still not permitting them just yet in dining rooms or activities or events. Uh, we are all suffering from mask fatigue. It's real and I know what it is and, and we're all tired of it. Uh, honestly, we've got some residents that just refuse uh, to wear a mask and uh, I wish they didn't, but some do, and, and uh, we try to deal with that. Uh, and it's interesting, sometimes like at a card game, I'll be honest with you, the ones that uh, are not wearing masks are sometimes the one that complain later that someone else is not. So I just encourage everyone, you know, think, yeah, go figure that one out, you know, but uh, think of your, yourself for sure, but also your friends and neighbors that you live with here and let's all try to be as safe as we can. Uh, it won't last forever. Uh, I can skip all these pages where someone else covered them. Thank you, committee liaisons. Uh, marketing here at the Village, we currently have 86% of independent living units sold and 84% are occupied. Pre-COVID, that number was about 93%, so it's definitely impacted us. However, in 2021, we had 26 sales of independent living units, which is about the same as a typical year pre-pandemic. So it's not that the sales efforts aren't there and aren't working. The problem is a couple of years ago in, 19, in 1919, 2019 and 2020, uh, you may recall, those of you that were here, we had a really high number of residents who passed away that year, and, uh, and that sort of set us back, and uh, it's been hard to recover from that. But current sales activity seems to be on track. It's just a matter of overcoming the setback we had a couple of years ago. One other thing that was unusual, this last year we had, I believe it was nine residents who moved out of the village. They were not unhappy, they loved it here and hated to leave, uh, but they went to be either live with or be near family. Somebody mentioned Diane Clark going to Houston and there were others of that sort. And uh, uh, some of them did it reluctantly at their family's insistence. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is that pre-COVID we never dealt with that much. It was really rare for anyone to do that. Uh, but during the pandemic, uh, we did see some of that going on. Uh, Melissa Ruckstad asked me to mention that February is heart month, and uh, Cassandra in the uh, fitness area will be having a heart fitness challenge that she'll be rolling out for the month of February. And February 4 is National Wear Red Day, and we are inviting all of our staff to wear red, a lot of you have a jump start on us here. We got a lot of red in the audience today. That's good. Uh, but we're inviting our staff to wear red and, and if you'd like to join them on February 4th, we'll do that. And we're also having, uh, promoting blood pressure testing among our staff that day, just to raise awareness of heart health. And uh, we always try to make those things fun and also get some points made and drive points home. Uh, I want to introduce now our Associate of the Month for January. And uh, I did this at one of my talks, but that was about three weeks ago, and I know that we have a bigger turnout at the resident council meeting than just come to hear me. So I wanted to uh, introduce this person again, and it's uh, Donna Shrimsher. So Donna, come up, please. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Donna, I'm embarrassing you twice this month, aren't I? <laughs> Donna is a nurse in uh, memory care, and she is the epitome of what we like to have in terms of providing care to our residents. Donna is so well loved by the residents that she works with and also their families. And uh, recently we had uh, a resident in memory care who passed away and the family actually mentioned in the obituary how appreciative they were of Donna's care. And uh, that's just what we see every day with Donna, her hearts and her work. And, and uh, Donna, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Also, yesterday we had uh, what we try to be annual. We didn't get to have one last year because of COVID restrictions, but we had an employee of the year luncheon. And uh, at that luncheon, we invite any employee who was named employee of the month throughout the year, uh, January through December, and we invite them to come and, and their supervisors were invited as well and uh, all of the directors. And then out of those 12, we pick an associate of the year. And uh, this person gets a nice little cash award, a $500 check, and lots of bragging rights and pictures in the paper. So, uh, and uh, we had a really good lunch hosted by the dining department. It was wonderful, and our associates got to enjoy what uh, all of you enjoy in the Monarch uh, every night. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, but these were 12 of the cream of the crop. They were the ones that were recognized monthly by either their managers or you residents and and uh, they, they all do a wonderful job so it was hard to pick one uh, but we managed to do so and it was Brigida Saradine. So Brigida come on up. <laughs> but, Brigida uh, leads our laundry department and does a wonderful job with that and she also pinch hits in housekeeping and does almost anything else she's asked to do. And she does a wonderful job. Uh, we've always said we'd like to clone her and yesterday I actually sat at the table with Brigida and I learned she has an identical twin sister. <laughs> So uh, the only problem is she lives in Eastern Europe, uh, but if Brigida can talk her into coming, she's got a job here because I think she would know so. what to do. So uh, Brigida, thank you. Would you like to say anything? Just thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm always getting lots of comments from residents as well on, on you, Brigida, so everyone notices the good work you do. Uh, that's about it for me. I will take any questions that you might have. Okay, you're going to let me off easy today. Oh, there is one? Oh, yes, ma'am. The question was, what are the criteria that must be met for us to allow family back into dining. Uh, we don't really have any set trigger points that we say when this happens, we do it. Uh, we look at uh, COVID activity rates in the community. Uh, here at the village, we like to know that it, there's just nothing going on of significance related to COVID infections. Uh, I consult with the medical people that serve on our board of directors. Uh, including one who is a leading infectious disease doctor and, and we just sort of, uh, it's one of those things you can't really say when it's going to be but you know it when it gets there. And uh, I can't really tell you right now how close we are to that. We're a lot closer than we were. Uh, but with these kind of infections rates, there's still a tremendous amount uh, going on out there. So it'll be a little while longer. Uh, but I know how important it is that all of you can have your family and friends in for dinner with you, and, and as soon as we can, we will. We want that as well. So. Anything else? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Landrum.
The, the question is, with uh, the new carpet in the Monarch, could we have rollers on all the chairs? And honestly, I hadn't thought about that, but I will. We'll, we'll talk about it and look into that. Um, you know, one, one concern uh, we always run into here, if we have rollers on chairs, it means they'll sometimes roll out from under people when they're trying to settle. But with the, that, I was gonna say, that carpet is very plush and very thick, and it would be much less likely to. We'll look into that and, and see if we could do it. I know it helps uh, to have those. And the thick carpet is why this door is sort of stuck open here. We're gonna have to trim the door uh, so that it will open and close. Uh, this carpet, uh, the installer also told me in 33 years, he said it's the best carpet I've ever seen from a construction standpoint and all. So uh, uh, it's, it's a lot thicker than the other. And we'll get that taken care of as well. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for all you do, and we, we appreciate very much your report. Okay, I think there's only one other thing we have to do, and that is to give out the door prize. Well, Margaret, if you bring your basket up, I'll draw a number and we'll see who gets the $50 cash. You haven't made off of the money, have you? Okay, the last four digits. 1930-1930. Last four numbers. Look at it again. 1930. Okay. Let's have another one, Margaret. Two zero five zero. Yes, here we go. All right, Laura Lee. Is that it? Yeah, Larry Apperson. Thank you. Is there anything else? Anybody? Any questions or any comments? Thank you for coming. We appreciate very much your being here. And we'll see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>